the location. Where are you at? And what, and what I mean by that is do you have an established market or do you have a potential outlet for your crop that you potentially will grow in this type of structure? Strength and design is also a concern uh, depending on where you're, you're, you're located in the U.S., depending on wind, snow, uh, the other types of extreme weather events. Um, and also with regards to trellising, which we'll touch on in a little bit later in this program. Um, also, you have to think about working conditions. Uh, generally speaking, in high tunnels, it's not the most favorable working conditions. Most of you know if you work in field crops, it's usually not the most favorable, but certainly in a high tunnel or greenhouse, the temperatures are going to be even greater. Um, like with most people, you have to think about the initial investment cost of a structure. It has to be affordable and something that you can be able to recoup the costs in, in a somewhat reasonable amount of time and be able to make the business be viable. Then the last thing is, you know, depending on how big you are, how, what the size of the operation is, labor availability is extremely important. It's something that uh, we're facing throughout the country, uh, particularly with respect to vegetable crops. So I want to talk to you about a few different design loads. So, I'm, and I'm going to use pictures really to illustrate that because I think that'll do it best. Uh, so the three loads that I'm going to touch on today are live load, wind load, and snow load. So the first image we're looking at here, uh, I know this isn't probably the typical high tunnel that most people build, but at least illustrates the concept of wind load. Clearly this structure made out of PVC and polyethylene is not designed for high winds. Now looking at the next slide here, this is just an example of snow load. And so one of the things that will dictate what the snow load is of a given structure is how far the bows are from one another, how far apart the bows are. And the bows are the curved structures that you, or the curved metal pieces uh, that go from one side to the other. Uh, most typically, for instance, you're going to have a four foot bow spacing, but if you were to say go up to a six or eight foot bow spacing, your snow load is going to be reduced, meaning you can't tolerate as much snow on the roof. And the other thing too, the different types of architecture will dictate how the snow is shed. So this is a Quonset type house, and this is going to be, be more susceptible to collapse under a heavy snow load as opposed to a Gothic arch. Let's talk about live load just briefly. I mentioned trellising earlier, and so you do have the opportunity with certain structures to trellis, um, trellis the crop from the structure itself. Here we're looking at uh, cucumbers, uh, both English, uh, English cucumbers and beta alpha types. These are both seedless type of cucumbers, so pollination isn't something we have to worry about in this particular setting. But you think about the weight of this crop when it's loaded with cucumbers, or for instance, if it was indeterminate tomatoes that were trellised from the structure, an individual plant, Loaded with fruit, including the vine weight, maybe could be 25, 30 pounds. Depending on the size of your structure, you could have anywhere from 200 to 600 plants uh, within a structure. So keep in mind that's a lot of weight kind of pulling down on the structure. And the structure has to be built to, to withstand that type of load. So I've already kind of mentioned that, uh, alluded to bow spacing already. Uh, again, as I said, it's going to be most common to be on four foot spacing, but I've seen some on six foot and greater. Uh, the other thing that you can see in this image here um, right now is you can see that we actually have trusses, uh, trusses at every bow. So you see here with the green arrow, we've got cross members and trusses at every bow. And so a lot of the high tunnels currently won't necessarily have uh, a truss at every bow or even a truss at all. And if you have a structure that doesn't have trusses, then trellising is probably not a good option from the structure. Let's take a moment to touch on orientation. And so when I think about orientation, I'm talking about is the house running, is the greenhouse or high tunnel running north-south or running east-west, the length of the structure. And so what you're trying to do is maximize light intensity and light uniformity. So one thing that you need to consider is, you know, given your, your piece of land that you have, and I've been to several locations like that, the particular producer didn't have a choice. They had to orient the structure based on the piece of land that they had. But if you do have that choice, in this particular latitude where we are in central Kentucky, if you have a freestanding structure like most people would have in a high tunnel, north-south is going to maximize light uniformity, or east-west is going to maximize total light. And so to make that maybe more simplified, you know, you do want a, a large amount of light, but if your light is not uniform in the structure, then your crop's not going to grow uniform. Productivity won't be uniform throughout the structure. The one thing that I'll mention, or really a point to, to note is though, this really plays more important, or is really more important when you're dealing with trellising crops, crops that can self-shade. So for instance, if you were growing a leafy green crop that's not going to shade one another, um, orientation is not such a big deal. However, I like to be flexible. You never know when you may shift crops. 
And so you may initially start with a non-trellis crop. You may eventually move to a trellis crop. And if your house is oriented east-west, you're not going to be able to maximize productivity. So let's talk about some of the different structural types. Uh, you have freestanding single tunnels. Uh, Quonset and Gothic uh, are probably the two most common. And actually, Quonset is probably the most common we've seen with high tunnels. Uh, but there's also gutter connected uh, with multiple tunnels and, and multiple bays. Just like with true greenhouses in here, I've also got some images to show you that. So what we're looking at here is a Quonset style structure. It's basically a semicircle or a, or a hoop house, some people refer to it as. Um, but what you can see here in this particular structure, notice you've got purlins are the straight pipes that run the length of the structure here. But that's the only structural integrity you've got aside from the bows itself. There's no trusses in this type of structure. But in this case, they're not actually trellising anything, so it's not not a major concern. Here we're looking at now a gothic arch design. This has got a true peak to it. Um, we were talking about snow load earlier. Um, and so a, particular, a structure with this type of design is going to shed snow a lot better than the Quonset style because of the angle of the roof. Uh, and so if you do live in an area or you're going to be building an area where you have significant amounts of snow, the Quonset, or excuse me, the Gothic arch is certainly the architectural design that I would consider. And then lastly, we've got a gutter connected type structure. There's a few different manufacturers for gutter uh, connected high, high tunnels. Haygrove is probably the most common or most well known at least, uh, but there are a few other manufacturers. Uh, but this is probably less common, uh, at least for uh, growers in the state of Kentucky, although I have seen a few of these in various places in the Midwest as well. Let's take a moment and talk about covering material. You can have rigid material, you can have flexible material. I would say that the flexible, like the clear polyethylene, is what most people are going to use. Uh, some people may use rigid material on their end wall. That's why I've got this picture here. Um, and what you can note is, though, this isn't a clear poly we're using here. This is actually a woven poly. It still lets light through, but it's going to last longer than the clear poly. Um, and it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but there's really not much square footage you're covering. Uh, and it's really a, a good investment over the long haul. But when you're thinking about covering materials in general, again, cost is something that always comes up. What's the durability of it? Are you going to be able to get three to five years out of it? Is there a possibility you can get more, uh, more time out of it? The other thing you have to think about, too, is the light transmittance, because not all covering material lets the same amount of light through. And a lot of times, the thickness or the components that that uh, material is made of are going to dictate the transmittance of the light. And then lastly, heat retention. Generally speaking, thicker materials are going to have greater heat retention. In high tunnels, it's pretty common that you only have a single layer uh, of polyethylene, but I have seen some structures where you have two layers of polyethylene. And so when you have the two layers of polyethylene, just like you do in greenhouses, you've inflated uh, the air layer in between those, and you, you get some uh, insulation to keep, uh, keep heat inside the structure. Most people, I want to talk uh, briefly just about interior space. Most people are going to be using typical rows. Uh, growing in plastic culture or some sort of soil bed type system. I want to mention hanging baskets because we do have some people that will also grow ornamental crops. And so I've shown this picture here. I just want to take a moment to mention a few things uh, to think about when, do, when considering doing something like this. So first of all, those hanging baskets are a lot of weight. So you're supporting that weight from the structure itself. So just like I said earlier with regards to trellising tomatoes or cucumbers, there's a lot of weight involved here. And you think about the media itself and once you add water to it, there's quite a bit of weight, so there's a real, real strong live load pulling down on the structure. So you say, well, maybe I have the structure that can support that. And I'll explain to you another reason why I still wouldn't want you to do that, or I would recommend you don't. So the one thing is why I wouldn't recommend it is that I've seen this happen before, where you've got ornamental crops, as you have pictured here, and hanging baskets, and they're above a vegetable crop or some sort of edible crop like tomato or bell peppers. Uh, so a couple different problems here. Quite often, uh, the Ornamental plants are not grown from seed. They're grown from plugs, and a lot of times those plugs come up from the southeast where they have pests year-round like thrips and white flies and aphids that can transmit virus. And I've seen it happen even in northern Indiana where they had tomato-spotted wilt virus in a high tunnel setting uh, well earlier than they should have, and then we found out they had ornamentals and they brought hitchhikers, so to speak, along with them. The other thing you need to consider, too, is if you have to spray pesticides, Keep in mind that most pesticides labeled for ornamental crops are not going to be labeled for food or vegetable crops. And if you're spraying those hanging baskets that are overhead, it's likely you're going to have drift coming down 
onto the edible crop now, and now you have uh, a, an unregistered or unlabeled use of the, the product, and technically you cannot market that product for sale or consumption at this point. Let's move on to the next topic. We'll talk about ventilation briefly. So there's various types of vents, or maybe I should say locations. So you can have roofs, side walls, and end walls. And we've got some pictures here I think that will help illustrate that better. Um, so what we're looking down at, we're looking down the side of a 30 by 96 foot high tunnel structure. We've got a, approximately a four to five foot side wall that rolls up from the, from the bottom up as opposed to dropping down. And so there's a couple things that I can explain to you or I'd like to point out here uh, really quickly. So at first I thought when I was building my first high tunnels that I would want to drop down side wall because if you drop down from the top as opposed to coming up from the bottom, you can drop down just a little bit and you can vent and get some of the heat out if you need and not and cold air is not going to rush in right at the root zone and where it would if you have it roll up straight from the bottom. This particular manufacturer wasn't able to retrofit those for us and in hindsight I'm actually glad that they were not able to. So what we came up with is this is the same woven poly material that we used on the end wall. We got pieces that were about four or five feet wide and then we got them cut to length which is 96 feet based on the structure. And so we dug a trench Along the inside of the footboard, we buried the bottom half of this. And if you see, you have ground posts here, and right at this juncture where you see the green arrow is where the bow and the ground post comes together. And at that point, the bow, or excuse me, the ground post actually nests within the bow. Then you have a bolt going through that to hold the two together. Well, when you put that bolt through, we had a little bit of extra thread left. So we actually put grommets every four feet on this fabric here and then we pulled that grommet up, pulled it over the remaining thread that we had left from the, the bolt and then we took additional nuts and we put those nuts up. And so now we have a sidewall that rolls up and we also have cold protection in the early part of the year when we're trying to vent. We don't want the cold air rushing at the root zone. And it's really simple to take that down for later in the year when you actually want the full four or five foot sidewall open. So the next slide, what we're looking at is just from the inside uh, at the sidewall, and you can see we're in a warmer time of year where we've actually dropped down the sidewall. We can point out here, you might be able to make them out, you can see where some of the bolts are coming off here and here, and this is where the grommets would have been placed over. We still leave this fabric here buried in the ground, the bottom part of it. We fold it up neatly, and then we used, in this case, J-block just to hold it down so it's not flapping in the wind and it's staying fairly clean. But really, you could use anything that you had on site. Uh, but you got to be careful that you, it's something that's not going to tear tear the fabric uh, as well. What we're looking at now is looking at the end wall. Uh, we're looking at the north side of this particular structure, looking into the south. We've got the ridge vent here. You can see that it's now fully open. Um, and I'll take a moment. We talked about orientation earlier, and uh, not all high tunnels are going to have ridge vents, but those that do, they're going to be able to remove the heat from the structure much easier. But if you don't orient the structure the proper way when you build it, it's going to be counterproductive. So, for example, from your right is the west, and on your left is the east. And in this particular site, the prevailing winds come from the west. So as you follow the green arrow, those winds come across the top, and they convectively pull hot air out the top when you need to. Had we oriented this structure the opposite way, flipped it 180 degrees, or let's say that the prevailing winds was coming from the left now. If the prevailing winds were coming from the left, and the structure is as it is, it's actually going to push hot air down into the structure, which is not what you want to happen. And then this is something a little different. Not all structures have such large doors, but we like large roll-up doors if we're going to try to use uh, somewhat smaller equipment in there, uh, actually using four-wheel tractors as opposed to two-wheel tractors. And this particular door is 16 feet wide and 9 feet tall. It just has a, a, a gate in there just for frame of reference for size. Now what we're looking at here is just an interior shot up at the roof. Uh, this is the ridge vent, uh, fully open. Uh, you can see some of these working components here uh, that run on uh, pinion gears essentially. And then you've got this shaft that's running the whole length of the structure. When that shaft rotates, that's driving these gears up and down. And that's going to open and close the vent. In this particular case, we actually did thermostatically automate uh, the opening of the ridge vent, you can see the motor here, but they do have manual chain drive operations, and that's what we initially installed this structure with, was the chain drive. Um, but for some of the nature of the work we needed, we needed to have some sort of backup ventilation system to make it easier. 
And so you don't you say, well, maybe I don't want to run tons of electricity to my structure. I want to try to use as little electricity as possible. If you want to automate, you don't have to necessarily automate everything. You can just automate the, automate the originate, for instance, and that will buy you some time. Because you'd be surprised how quickly these structures will heat up on a clear day when it's 30 or 40 degrees outside, and they'll be pushing 90, 100 degrees pretty quickly. <clears throat> Let's talk about cooling now. And prim the primary way to have cooling in a, in a high tunnel really is shading. And so I've seen two different methods utilized in high tunnels and greenhouse. You've got shade cloth on the roof as depicted here. And there's also the potential to apply shade paint. So the one thing that I, in my experience is I seem to like the shade cloth better. I prefer the shade cloth. The re one of the reasons being is if you don't put the shade paint and an even coating over top of the roof, you're not going to have uniform shading. So you may be letting more light through or causing more shade on one particular part of the roof. You buy shade cloth, as you see here, you buy it in a certain percentage, whether it be 20 or 30 percent or even greater, and you know that that's going to be uniform across the structure. We mentioned trellising earlier, um, and I've got some red lines here to highlight some of these aircraft cables. This is one eighth inch uh, braided steel aircraft cable. So we've got cables that are running the length of the house, which are going to be over each of the rows. You can also see some of the spools here where we actually will drop down the string and we're, which we're going to trellis the plant up, whether it be tomato or pepper or even cucumber. But the thing is, we've also added these drop cables and if we, at every bow. And so if we didn't have these drop cables, you could imagine if you were hanging something really heavy, and I know you can't see me, I'm a really big guy, but if I jump up and hung up from the middle of that cable, a lot of weight is going to be pulling in on those end walls. So we've actually distributed the weight more evenly across the structure by having these drop cables down every four feet. So I, I mentioned that one of the cables that's running the length of the house, you're actually physically tying it in to the end wall with a, a bolt and a loop. Here we've added, used some of the additional uh, extra square steel tube we had. <clears throat> we made some brackets and we're actually using a, a small trailer winch and that can increase the tension over time. You may need to increase the tension on that. We can adjust that as needed. Um, as you're looking at in this particular house, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what we did in this house was we wanted to have flexibility in our row spacing because we may not always have the same crop or the same row space. And so what you see here now is a, a fairly recently transplanted cucumber crop uh, starting to be trellised. We you can see these strings that have been dropped down now uh, from the spools overhead that are attached to the aircraft cable and are dropped down and clipped to these individual plants. Uh, let's let's kind of switch gears a little bit. We've talked about some of the different components of structures, things to consider. Um, but I, I found some interest in this, and I know a lot of people are, are still just buying their high tunnels and starting to build them uh, themselves. So I just want to take kind of take you through a timeline of some of the construction processes that I've had uh, had the opportunity to be a part of uh, over the last five years. Um, so what you actually see in this first image um, is actually the grading of the site. Now, not all sites need to be graded. In the high tunnels that I built in Indiana uh, a few years ago, the site was fairly level and we were on sandy ground, so we didn't grade the site at all. Uh, but this particular location, these were two old field plots, and they had actually, over a number of years of plowing, had started had, had eroded a lot of soil, so they were a lot lower than the drive rows. And if we built those high tunnels right in that low spot, you've now covered a piece of ground, and so when it rains, all that water is going to shed off of those roofs, and if you're in a low spot, it's going to actually funnel into the tunnel, which is not what you want. So because of that, the site that we had at this location, we actually graded the site. And not everybody will be able to do that. But if you have the opportunity, we actually raised it up slightly and graded away from each tunnel to better funnel the water away. And we're actually we're not complete with the process. And so we still actually have the option of inserting uh, some drain tile, uh, which I think is going to be beneficial down the road, particularly in some of the heavier type soils that we work with here in Kentucky. So after you've got your site graded uh, and, and ready to go, um, you have to flag out the four corners where you want your structure to be. Uh, this is a good time to get some measuring tapes and those types of things. Uh, and certainly it's good to have at least a couple pair of hands to help you out with this through the process. And I want to say that this is probably the most, one of the more crucial stages of the construction process, especially if you're going to add concrete onto your ground post, which is something that I do recommend. Uh, there's only one, one chance to set them in concrete because once the concrete's hardened, uh, there's no going back. 
there's no easy going, no easy way to go back. So the next slide we're, we're looking at here is we've got the site. You can still see the flags that we had placed. Now what we're putting in is our what we call batter boards, and this is going to help square up the structure to make sure that we get the ground post perfectly aligned and we get the building square and oriented north-south as we want it to be. So a little further along in the process, once we've identified that spot, um, when I was in Indiana, we actually used just manpower and used post hole diggers. Uh, here, here at UK, we actually have an auger, made the job a little bit easier uh, to auger the holes out as opposed to digging uh, all by hand. Uh, and each of these is going to have uh, 26 ground posts. Uh, and so that's a lot, of, would have been a lot of holes to dig, I can say that. So now once we've got our four corner uh, holes uh, augered and prepared, we've got our batter boards up. We tie a string to these batter boards and we run them from uh, one corner to the next. And this is what's going to help us line up our ground posts so they're at the right height and that they're straight in a line running from uh, south to north. So we've added a, one string coming from one direction. Now we've got the same string coming from the other direction and kind of where those two cross and those two meet, that's where the center of the post should be. So we also have made some markings here because we made some measurements to ensure that we have the appropriate depth uh, when we set those in the ground uh, in, into concrete. And so now you can see um, here in a moment uh, where we've got those marks to get the appropriate depth. But one thing I want to, I want to make note of is anytime you're putting something round like a pipe in concrete, uh, we actually drilled holes through there and put a 10-inch steel rod through there. And the reason we did that is that gives the concrete something to bite or something to hold on to. Because if you put a round post like that directly in concrete over time between uh, freeze and thawing in the soil, that concrete's going to fracture and that pole's going to pull right out. So now uh, we've actually got a sledgehammer. We're going to drive these to the appropriate depth. Uh, you can actually see most kits will actually come with a piece that fits straight into the ground post so you can actually bang on it and not destroy your ground post while you're trying to drive them into the ground. And remember I showed you earlier there's a little bit of a, uh, a marker where we put a placement for the depth and you can see that we're using that and lining that up here uh, with the string to make sure everything is aligned and appropriate. So now once we have uh, gotten those, those types of things arranged and we've gotten the, the initial four ground posts set in concrete, we tie a string from one to the next. We run our measuring tape, and we're trying to put our spacing, and we put spray paint out to be on four-foot centers. So after we've marked out all the additional ground posts, now it's time to auger those holes and prepare that so we can set the, the remaining ground posts on a given structure. And here's just showing you a little bit further along in the process going on as we, as we uh, continue to auger one hole after the next, trying to maintain. Um, and so you see we have a couple people working here. You know, you've got to have one guy that's operating the PTO and the tractor. You're actually going to have one guy who's kind of holding and leveling this. Just to point out, make sure you're not getting caught up in the PTO shaft by anything that's long and hanging off of you if you've got long hair. And then you've got somebody else here. This gentleman is helping watch the depth and making sure that it's going to the appropriate depth. So now what you're looking at is the pad that we initially had set up and, and created for the construction of the site. We've got our four ground posts, four corner ground posts uh, installed in concrete. And now what you can see is we've got all the remaining holes prepared and ready to go uh, for the additional ground posts. So as we're moving along in that process, we tie some strings. We put a bolt through the top of this ground post, the, the corner ground post. We run some strings, and this is going to help us get our alignment uh, with the remaining ground posts. As we start to put some of those ground posts in, we also have a level to make sure we're checking level height because I just want to reiterate, once you set these in concrete and that sets up, there's no, no going back. And this is just kind of showing a finished stage of the product where we've got all the ground posts in concrete um, and we're letting the concrete set up at this point. And once that concrete is set, we'll fill in with this remaining dirt that's uh, on the surface. So after you've got your ground posts in, the next phase is to move on to bows. Um, in some cases, you can actually build uh, the trusses and attach them to the bows before uh, erecting the bows. Uh, in this case, we chose not to. Um, and so you have to think about how you're getting them to the site. Uh, the last high tunnels that I've built, we actually uh, built those close to the, to the structural location. So we just picked them up and walked them over there. In this particular case, 
the gravel pad that we had uh, to build these on was quite a bit of a distance to walk uh, with that with that kind of uh, that kind of load. So we were able to put this basket on our uh, forks on our tractor. Uh, and actually, if you note here too, just to be thinking, these could very easily slide off and land on this gentleman here in the cab of the tractor. He had some good foresight ahead of him. He took four by fours, wired those in here to prevent those from sliding off and causing any injury. So as he comes up, he's actually driving to the far north end, and he's and he's backing up and putting in one bow after the next. You can see here, um, we've got one side fed in. After he's got one side started, he comes over to the other side and feeds that one in. So you can just kind of see in this image here, further along in the process, we started to add some bows. We're getting closer and closer to being done. As you can see depicted here, we've got all the bows up. The one thing, the one thing that's critical that we don't have up in this particular image is one of the purlins. Keep in mind, I mentioned purlins earlier. Purlins actually run. Uh, purlins actually run the length of the structure, um, and so you're going to have a purlin at the very peak, and so. What we did was we timed it right so we got all these bows up and we still had to have enough time that we could put one purlin on top. Because as it is now, those bows are going to flop and wobble back and forth quite a bit, particularly at this site where we have quite a bit of wind. So make sure when you're putting the bows up that you've got enough time in the day still to at least add one purlin and that will give you enough structural integrity to walk away for a day till, till tomorrow or even if you've got to walk away two or three weeks depending on what else you might have going on in your life. So we were talking about the, the purlin here. We can see we've installed this here, uh, looking down the length of the structure, just showing the bolts. And fortunately, these from this manufacturer are all pre-drilled, so you don't have to fool with the drill up there. Once you get the, the purlins up there, you can just drop the bolt through and add the nut on the bottom. And again, we were using that same basket that we'd used to bring the bows over uh, for the person to, to help uh, install the bolts and install the purlin. Here we've got an, uh, another individual further along in the process after they've installed the top purlin, we're starting to build the trusses now. So you can see we've got some of the diagonal cross members and then some that run side to side or east to west. So um, like I said, we, we're still building these structures at UK and so to continue the process, these are some of the images from the last uh, build that I did at my previous location. So you can see in this image here we've got assembled bows with trusses. Um, not all the bows are on in place in this particular image, but they're actually working on the footboard. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of, everybody's going to kind of have a different building process that they go through. And it's just, it's also partially dictated by what else you have going on. And when we built these, we had lots of other farm projects we were working on. And so you might work a day on the project and walk away for two or three. And so you just kind of got to chip away at it as you can. So in this image, we've got complete assembly of the bows and the footboards, as well as all the purlins. Um, and so we're ready to start thinking about possibly adding the ridge vent or possibly doing some end wall construction at this stage. Um, so in this picture here, we've got the completed footboard at the bottom. And in this case, at the top, instead of a true hip board, we don't actually use lumber. We're actually using a double wiggle wire, cha wiggle, wiggle wire channel uh, that has special brackets to mount directly to the bow using tech screws. Here's some of the end wall construction. We're using square steel tube for this construction. A lot of people will opt for wood, uh, certainly because it's less expensive, but the life expectancy of this square steel is going to be much greater than that of even the pressure treated lumber. So now we've pretty much got the end wall construction completed. We've also got a walk-in man door over here on the right, and usually you want to have at least one of those, because again, in the cool time of the year, I don't want to roll up a 16-foot wide door and let, up, let out all the heat if I can just slide right into that kind of door. So we've got a completed end wall with some of the covering here at this stage. You can actually see at the close to the peak some of the beginning phases of the ridge vent construction. And now basically you can see a completed end wall roll up with or end wall with the roll up door complete viewing from the inside. And you can also see the, the raised side walls, uh, their interior. As far as uh, what you're seeing in this image here, you're looking at the top, you're seeing the ridge vent opening. It's only partially open on the right. Uh, but you've got uh, the sidewall fully open, just showing you the curtain that we had uh, from one of the previous slides. This is just showing you the south side of the structures with the fully opening ridge vent on the structure on the left. And just showing you from a different angle or a different perspective with the end wall door. So with that, uh, I think uh, here's my contact information, both email and office phone number, but I'm going to pass it over to Krista Jacobson.
And I think we'll take questions uh, once we're complete with the presentation. All right, great. Thanks, Shubin. So you might be asking yourselves, after all of that, why would you want to add another layer of complexity and try to make these things move? With all the things that Shubin has said about potential threats from the environment to take this structure down after you have gone to all this work to put it up, why would you add an element to make this thing mobile? Well, there are a number of reasons that um, generally experienced high, high tunnel growers think about movable high tunnels, and a lot of it has to do with just over a certain amount of time, soils really take a beating. This is high value real estate. You're oftentimes growing, and if not year round, a good chunk of the year, um, pretty intensively. It doesn't oftentimes afford uh, economically afford room for things like cover crops or other types of things that we like to do to help the soil rest. So um, different things like uh, your soil structure tends to degrade over time. You can get things can get compacted in there uh, with just a lot of foot traffic and things like that. If you're growing tomatoes all the time, which is quite common, you might want to rotate to just get move to a different spot to get disease out of there. Um, one of the main concerns though that we hear is a real fear of salinity. So it's not a, hu a hugely widespread problem to have uh, saline soils in your tunnels, but when it does happen to you, it is bad. And it can create a lot of problems with micronutrient uptake, um, dwarf plants, all kinds of issues there. And it can come from a lot of different sources. We're not just talking about sodium salts from fertilizers like sodium nitrate. It can come from uh, high calcium and magnesium uh, content, animal manure-based compost, manures. It can come from all over the place. And, it's not necessarily that any one application is going to put you over the edge in terms of um, creating a saline soil type situation. It's that we don't have flushing rains inside these tunnels. So you don't get any leaching of those salts out that you would normally get in the field environment. So you could be a fantastic field grower and bring those same practices into a tunnel and have some problems in your soil after a certain number of years. So that's what leads folks to think about movable high tunnels. So rather than taking year off and leaving that plastic off to leach, uh, to leach those um, salts out, uh, you might consider a movable tunnel. It does also afford some um, additional opportunities for thinking really creatively about your rotation. So this idea of being able to move the heat during certain times of the year and then getting the heat off the crop when it doesn't need it. Um, so there, there's, there are some really creative growers out there that are using movable high tunnels for those kinds of purposes, but we'll talk about those in a future webinar. Today we're going to talk mostly about our story at the UK uh, High Tunnel Research Facility on Horticulture Research Farm. So we um, have a replicated field study here where we've got three movable high tunnels as well as three stationary tunnels. And what we decided to do was to try to build three movable structures, 30 by 72, the way that a grower would do it. So how would you buy a stationary kit and make it move using different techniques that growers around the country are using to uh, make their tunnels move as well as some commercial models. So we have two tunnels that uh, are moved by uh, being on skis or skids and I'll walk you through those and then one that's on a rail track. Uh, so these are all made, these are all made on the farm. Um, so we've made a lot of mistakes that we'd be happy to share with you. So if you decide to do movable tunnels uh, fabricated on your own farm, you don't repeat some of our mistakes. So there's three main forces that you want to consider. Um, so I'm going to kind of structure how I talk about the, uh, the tunnels and all of these different options based on um, three main physical forces that you're going to be fighting when you go to move these tunnels or, or, and or try to keep them in place. So the first one is friction. I have a grower friend who's been working with movable tunnels for about seven years now. And when we talked about building our tunnels out on the farm four years ago, she said, do not underestimate the force of friction to get these things moving. You're, you might, everything might make on sense on paper when you run those calculations, but getting those things to move can be a real challenge. So we'll talk about friction, specifically how that relates to how you're gonna move the tunnel. Uh, uplift is significant, so if you're not gonna be anchoring those tunnels, or those ground posts uh, in concrete, you need to figure out how to anchor them, and there are a lot of different options out there that we'll talk about. And then the other uh, force that's maybe not quite as obvious, but it sure is when you start to move them, is called camber force. And that's the force that pushes down, uh, basically the weight of the tunnel, it pushes down and causes the uh, edges to splay out. So you could start with a 35, 30 foot wide tunnel and end up with a 35 foot wide tunnel by the time you move it, if you don't do something uh, to, uh, to contain that splay. And so I'll show you a couple pictures of how we do that as well. All right, so in thinking about how to fight that friction, how you're gonna move the tunnel, before you even think about how, you're, how you'll physically do it, you want to think about what resources you have on the farm to move the tunnel. Are you equipped with, with tractors potentially to pull the tunnel? That's quite common for ski and skid type designs. You might, if you don't already have a winch or have a, um, 
a friend of the farm with um, with a, tra uh, a towing rig or something like that set up. You can move them with winches, or you can uh, you can also purchase them. But there are also options out there that don't require any type of mechanization. It can just be pulled with people and draft power. So um, if you're adding wheels or something like that to the tunnel. So we have all these different uh, different types of moving systems on the farm. So I'll kind of show you uh, what we do as well as what some other folks have done. So these ski or skid type systems are essentially dragging the tunnel across the ground. And there's various ways that you, various materials that you can drag the tunnel on. So there's pipe skids that are basically made from uh, the same material, same galvanized pipe that you're making the rest of the structure out of that are generally welded to the um, to the pipe. So that takes a little bit of some welding skills. So doing that one on the farm is a little bit difficult. You need some welding skills. Some other options out there are using things like um, some type of a metal angle, whether it's galvanized steel or four inch aluminum is what we use on the farm. Um, so we don't have to run into the issues of sometimes you can get some um, volatile organic compounds coming off if you're welding galvanized steel. Um, so we use uh, aluminum angle, but people also use wood or some type of composite. So we actually have uh, what we call our Lowe's Special, or our hardware store special, um, is uh, made out of Trex decking. So we just went over to the hardware store across the street from the farm and bought some decking as our as the uh, main material that we're gonna that we're gonna drag those uh, skis on. And they're they're called oftentimes skis uh, because you you can think of how you you can think of the end of the tunnel as having a ski tip on it because you have as you're dragging this thing you want to make sure that you're staying above the ground and not dragging them into the ground and so. Uh, you're going to need to fabricate some type of a ski tip to, uh, to fashion to the end of the tunnel. And then you can see we have a very large uh, eye bolt at the end that, that we uh, hook into and drag with a, um, with a, a, to a towing winch or something like that. Uh, so these are rolling type systems. Uh, so these would be able to be moved with uh, human uh, power. So uh, our 30 by 72 tunnel, we have five inch gate wheels that uh, ride on the top rail that runs the length of the three plots that we move the movable tunnel through. And we can move those with six people uh, without, um, without any uh, kind of mechanical power. I know some folks will also use draft animals. There's different ways to make these uh, wheeled systems work. So metal is the most common, but there's a, a new commercial model out there that's called a V-track where instead of laying down a pipe track, you lay down this, uh, this V-shaped metal, uh, and then there's a grooved uh, wheel that rests across the top. But it's the same principle. You're just reducing friction by adding wheels. So now let's talk a little bit about anchoring this thing. I just put this fairly texty slide up here just to, that you all can read for yourselves, but you get the idea here that there is a fair amount of uh, uplift that can happen on a high tunnel. You're basically looking at an airplane wing uh, hanging out there, and if you're not going to use concrete to lay it in, uh, to, to anchor it, you need to add something else. So uh, it's very difficult to get uh, your high tunnel manufacturers uh, or even an engineer to tell you exactly how much uh, wind load you need to be able to uh, to uh, engineer for because it's quite variable based on the site. But some conservative numbers that we found out there show about uh, 220 pounds of uplift per foot in quite a heavy wind, so 80 mile an hour wind. Um, so we're really talking about once you account for the weight of the tunnel, anywhere from 12 to 15,000 pounds of anchoring that you want to account for. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, you can do that through uh, using uh, grape arbor anchors, uh, earth anchors, or something like that. Sometimes folks also know these as uh, anchors for trailers. It's the same same type of thing. They are uh, frequently rated to be uh, 1,500 to 2,500 pounds of, of vertical pulling power. Um, that a vertical pulling force that they can withstand, and that's going to vary based on the size of that helical shape that you see at the bottom. So it, it varies based on the size of the of the spiral that's anchored in the ground. Uh, at the as as Shubin mentioned, our uh, field site, our at the horticulture farm is quite windy, and so we didn't totally trust that we could get a, uh, our full amount of anchoring with just those uh, arbor anchors. So we actually put a telephone pole anchor on each corner. Um, we didn't want these things blowing down the fairly busy highway that runs right next to the farm. And so uh, we use uh, something uh, like this, uh, this large screw that you see on the right side of the slide there. And it's actually 40, it's 46 inches long and it holds about 14,000 pounds of uplift on each. So it might be overkill, but we'd rather avoid having the problem. Uh, but there are a number of other types of, um, pin, uh, types of anchor systems out there, including rebar pins and things like that. And I'll show you how you fashion those to the tunnels in just a moment. But before you, uh, before you place those things, you wanna figure out whether you're gonna be placing them on the inside or the outside of the tunnel. And there's compelling reasons for both. If you place those anchors on the inside of the tunnel, you're sacrificing cropping space. And so as we said, this is, this is high value real estate and you don't wanna be uh, sacrificing any potential production area inside. 
However, if you place them outside the tunnel, you frequently run into issues of mowing and other types of maintenance around those, um, around those uh, pins and things. And so for us, just knowing number of students that we have out on the farm running mowers and things like that, we thought we ought to err on the side of caution and put our anchors on the inside. So you're going to see some pictures on the inside. Most commercial models anchor them on the outside. So I only, I only bring this up to point out some discrepancies and pictures that you're going to see here in a moment. All right, and so then how do you fasten the high tunnel to these anchors? There's a couple of main ways this is done. The first is with turnbuckles. So you see in the picture on the right here, there's a turnbuckle that's fashioned to an, the eye bolt that runs through the tow board to the uh, grape anchor in the ground. Uh, and it's just a commercial turnbuckle that you can find at any type of fastener type store. They are a little bit spendy though, um, but it gives you a very tight anchoring um, and not a lot of wiggle room. So there's a lot of advantages to using that. They are a little bit spendy though. Um, and then you see um, that combined with some wire ropes in this other picture. Um, it gives you a little bit more wiggle room than you would have in the, um, with just using a turnbuckle. So this is what we use. This is a picture from the horticulture research farm with our movable tunnels. And we use wire ropes that anchor down to uh, the grape anchors. We have five <coughs> uh, of those grape barber anchors that run the length of the 72 foot tunnel. And then on each end, one of those um, big uh, telephone pole anchors. And then at each of those anchors, um, we run um, wire ropes, quarter inch uh, wire rope that's just fastened with wire nuts that goes through an eye bolt. So when Shuban talked about there being a bolt that anchors or that connects the ground post to the bow, we replace that with an eye bolt. And then we use that piece, so we're still getting that fastening that we need for the, um, the ground post to connect to the bow, but it also now functions as a place for us to uh, put those um, put that wire rope. And so we just lash that together. Now when we go to move the tunnel, it's, we just use a, um, just use a uh, nut driver, zip off those nuts, take off the wire rope, and, and roll the tunnel down the way. So now we're talking about that, this camber force issue. So what kind of bracing are you going to need during the move? So there's a couple of features I want to point out in this slide here. The first one is, uh, the first two are ways that to cross brace the tunnel to limit both racking, um, which is the shaking back and forth of the tunnel as you're moving it. That's particularly important with these models that have a lot of friction, these skid or ski type models. Um, so these can be done using something like a tow bar, which you see uh, in that top arrow, as well as ratchet straps. Um, and sometimes you see both. So this is a commercially available model. Um, where they, they use both just to err on the side of caution. You actually see that their uh, towing winch uh, is hooked up to their ratchet straps and their tow bar is what's stabilizing the, the width of the tunnel. So what the main thing here is you can use a lot of things, but you need some type of support to limit the splay on the tunnel so that those sides don't expand out as you're moving, uh, the, moving the tunnel to its next stop. The other piece that's important to point out here is you can see that this, the door is not flush with the ground. And that's really important because you can't drag a flush door across the ground. You ha it has to be, uh, you have to think about the end walls as well, not just how you're moving these things. So you'll want to have a, a, at least a couple of feet um, to be able to flip that front end up. There's lots of different ways to do this. Oops. All right, so the way that we've actually done this on the farm is we've played with a few different ways to do it. Um, and we talked about uh, using modular removable end wall panels. So this is what we initially started with. And we basically made it so that we could pop out the entire uh, end wall in modular panels. This was really handy if you have a high trellised crop. So for example, if you're starting a, or you're going over a crop, so you've got a, um, some field tomatoes that you want to protect or, or some peppers started or something like that, and you want to drag the tunnel to the crop to give it extra heat in the fall, you need to have a fair amount of clearance there. So one you can, way you can do that is to have these end wall panels pop off. We found that actually to be a little bit tricky once you get the tunnel to its final spot um, to, have, to get these things back in place there is always a little bit of movement in the tunnel. And so that became a little bit hard to get all the end walls popped back in correctly. So what we do now is have, we've actually hinged those end walls fairly high up. So we, they're hinged at about three feet up. So we have the option of popping the end wall panels entirely off or to fold them up. And we really try to fold them up as much as we can, just minimize the number of moving parts that goes into a moving operation. So this is actually us moving one of our, this is moving our Trex decking based system. 
And uh, we, we do this typically with two towing winches, one on either side. You can see we're going over the top of a, of a, of a fairly established crop onto another uh, crop that we're trying to bring the heat to. So this would be leaving a uh, summer eggplant uh, and pepper crop and going over the top of some fall greens that we want to protect further in the winter <coughs> that we've established in late July or early August in the field when it was just too hot to establish those things in a high tunnel. So uh, we, as I said, we did these ourselves. And so these are some costs um, for uh, the movable tunnels that we built at, at UK. Um, so it's a 30 by 72 foot kit. Now I want to emphasize these were 2010 prices. So um, tie tunnel costs have gone up a little bit since then. So uh, we're using a fairly basic kit, two layers of plastic, six foot roll up sides. And you see the cost of the tunnel kit there. And then you see some of the add-ons there. So side and end wall materials. So uh, the other types of materials that you need, you know, for example, tow boards, hip boards, stuff like that. You generally want to account for another 25% of the cost of the kit just to cover the incidentals that aren't included in the kit. So those, those are the same across the board. Um, and then the main cost differential, I'm just going to point out here, I'm not going to walk through this entire table, um, is just the difference in, in the ski or movable materials. So you can see the more steel you add, the more metal you add, the pricier it gets. So if you're using some type of wood or composite, uh, which isn't going to last as long and it's going to have a lot more wiggle in it, it's relatively inexpensive. So we added about $600 to our, um, to our uh, cost of our tunnel. Using that aluminum angle was about $1,000, and using a rail type system where we just you could work with your greenhouse company to supply the uh, some additional piping, but we worked with a local fencing company that cost us around $2,000. So bottom line, you're adding anywhere from around $1,000 to an extra $3,000 to make these tunnels move. So you really want to make sure that it's going to be worth your while and be thinking how are you going to manage these systems um, before you start going down the, the movable tunnel path. Uh, it, can, it can offer a lot of flexibility in your production system, but it can also offer a lot of headaches. So I just want to point out a couple of resources before I wrap up here. We have a very nascent website um, that has some of our uh, resources up there. Um, so different design considerations, um, what we're producing in the tunnels. We've got some nice videos of the movable tunnels uh, in particular, some of the rationale behind why you'd want to move these things and some video of us moving them. Um, we have a blog that we update not as often as we should, um, but it does uh, say what's going on with the tunnels any given time of year and what's coming up next. So you can kind of see what we're thinking about for uh, timing of planting dates and things like that, as well as um, ability to contact us. Um, there's, I just want to put a few other movable tunnel resources out there. Uh, the universities are definitely getting on the scene about this, but it's been out in the grower community uh, for a while now. So here's a few resources that we found useful in researching how to do this. And with that, here's my contact information and the link to that website. And I would welcome, if not, uh, if you really don't have time to do a lot of uh, question and answer today, I would welcome questions anytime uh, about the movable tunnel setup at the farm. Great. Well, thank you, Krista and Shubin both. We've had a few questions come in as we've been sitting here. Um, I guess I can go ahead and read them to you guys as we go through. Um, so I just want to remind everyone, go ahead and type in the questions um, that you have in the chat box, and we'll try to uh, answer as many, as many as we possibly can. Um, and I also wanted to note before we go too far, that a copy of this presentation will be available for you guys to download from the internet um, along with the recording. Um, so if you just want to get back on and see some of the slides, um, just to you know, look at them a little closer, they will be available um, hopefully in the next two days on our website. So we have a question for you, Shubin. Um, how much extra cost is involved with the ridge vent? As, as far as the additional cost associated with the ridge vent, first of all, you have to find a manufacturer that provides that as an option. Um, I know there's more than one manufacturer. The one that I'm most familiar with currently is Rimmel. Uh, I would say you're probably looking in somewhere in the two to $3,000 range. But again, that's it's kind of an open-ended question because how big is your tunnel? Is it a 30 by 48? Is it a 30 by 96? I mean, the cost is going to vary drastically based on that. <clears throat> but I guess what I will point out is this. This is more anecdotal than anything. Uh, when I was building my first set of high tunnels that had a ridge vent uh, about four years ago, I had two growers stop by <clears throat> and they asked me about the ridge vent and then I told them the added cost with it and they seemed to think that it was too much and I can understand that and I can understand their perspective certainly. But the same few gentlemen came by about two years later and they were asking about how to retrofit a ridge vent onto an existing high tunnel. And they started to see, and I think that was after the summer of 2012 where it was 108 outside and it was 130 degrees in the high tunnel. And that's one with the ridge vent, mind you, so I don't know how hot it was without the ridge vent. 
bottom line is ridge vent can really do a lot. You know, oftentimes we talk about high tunnels as providing heat and, and extending the season, but you're going to try to grow in these most uh, just as much in the summertime, I would think, depending on what crops. And so being able to get rid of that heat is something also you need to be aware of. So I guess kind of a long answer to your question, but uh, if you're thinking at all considering something with a ridge vent, do it from the beginning. Uh, it's really very difficult or next to impossible to try to retrofit an existing structure with a ridge vent. Okay, thank you, Shubin. Another question you just did a little bit is, do you have a list of suppliers mm -hmm. for high tunnels? Um, I don't have a specific list, but it's certainly something if you contact me, I mean, off the top of my head, I could pull together for you and give you some ideas and pros and cons, um, you know, why I might choose one over the other. And, you know, one question actually I see up there right now is, do you prefer a Gothic or Quonset tunnel and why? And so just to go ahead and kind of address that it's in the same, same kind of uh, vein, so to speak. Um, so I prefer, I prefer the, uh, the Gothic arch as opposed to the Quonset. And the reason being is because, you know, my background initially was from true greenhouses where I was trellising vegetable crops and the Gothic arch, you're going to be more likely to be able to trellis those crops and it's better set up than in a Quonset style. Um, not that you can't do it in a Quonset, but it's a little bit more difficult. Something that I already mentioned too earlier, you're going to shed snow a lot easier on a high tunnel. Um, that's going to have a gothic arch as opposed to a quonset and they seem to do better even in wind so the structure the <clears throat> this particular gothic arch that I was using was called a nor'easter <clears throat> and those particular structures which you saw earlier in these in the slide presentation I can assure you that we've seen multiple days of straight line winds at 70 miles an hour at that particular location and granted we have concrete on every ground post but those structures haven't budged we've also seen 16 inches of snow in a 24 hour period no effect because it slid right off the roof. Uh, we didn't have to go out and take a broom and push from the inside out. And I was talking to a colleague not too long ago who was having to do that over last week when we had all the snow. And well, he was talking about how tough a job it was. And I've done it at least once or twice myself. And I can certainly attest to that. So <clears throat> as far as that goes, I would always pretty much prefer the Gothic over the Quonset. Okay, thank you. And one more um, question associated with structures is, have either one of you done anything with um, with high tunnels using geo air? I think you're probably referring to geothermal heat. Um, I know one greenhouse producer out uh, closer to Western Kentucky that's doing it, not successfully. He's actually had to add supplemental heating using a propane source. It's not to say that it can't work, um, but I think you really need to do your homework and and talk to somebody and talk to some engineers that know about geothermal, <clears throat> and then we can work together with them since we know more about plants, you know, and, and what the plants needs are. And so we can get you to a point where you can find something because you can spend a lot of money on geothermal and not, not have it work. And if it doesn't work, well, I mean, you can really waste a lot of time on it. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, another question is how much warmer will the inside be on a cloudy day? I think probably either of you could answer that um, for a high tunnel. Well, we keep uh, data loggers in our high tunnels. So we have about three years of temperature records. It really de it depends on how cold it is outside. Um, so on cloudy and, and windy too. So you know, there's, if, if there's any, even if your wind isn't getting into your high tunnel, it will pull heat away from the tunnel. So you can expect during the daytime, a couple of degrees on a, on a, on a very cold day and all the way up to you know, 15 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit. But there's a lot of other factors that go, that go into it. So if we're talking about a really cold, cloudy, uh, wintry day, you're not, it'll be warmer in there, but not a lot. But if you're talking about a spring day that's cloudy, maybe not super breezy, it was warm the previous day, so the soil's warm inside the tunnel, it can be significantly warmer. But there's, there's, a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of factors involved. Not to, not to shrug that question, it's just a really, it's a really complicated question. And you have a hard time getting manufacturers to answer that question too, for, the, for those reasons. Okay, great. You want to add anything to it? No, I think that was addressed appropriately. Okay, great. Another question was, mm -hmm. cold, can cold frames be movable and can they have different ventilation options like roll-ups and sidewalls and stuff like that? Um, I know she was I, referring I mean, I, to our last Sure, okay. Well, I mean, a lot of these things in protected agriculture kind of come together. And if you're probably talking about the traditional cold frame, no, you're probably not likely to move it. Um, you're not necessarily going to vent it uh, either. I mean, it, it's really open-ended because, I mean, there, there's so many different things you can do based on what your system is, and I've seen all sorts from top to bottom, from 
not very technologically advanced to the most technologically advanced. Um, but as far as that goes, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't really have probably much more to add, add to that. Well, thank you. Uh, we, this one question is for you, Shubin. Um, trellis rating, is it provided by the manufacturer? It's a good question. So you kind of got to press hard if you want to get that from the manufacturer. And I don't think all of them will give it to you. And some of them will actually, if, if you push them for that, they will make you actually pay for stamped engineered drawings to get that. Um, and so... Again, the answer is not going to be the same for every manufacturer. It's something that I wanted, though, and so you need to kind of push. Um, you know, and, and plus what they're willing to tell you also from the manufacturer's perspective is kind of dictated by the construction environment. You know, so when I'm building something at a university and everything has to absolutely be to code and we have to follow every rule and regulation, um, and I'm not saying that I promote you to, to not do that, but Sometimes in a, in a farm, you, you have the ability to do things a certain way that, that suits you better, but we certainly can't do that because we're trying to set an example in this particular case. So as far as you, you can get some, but, you know, you really need to think about what crop it is you're growing. And, and all in all, just kind of as a general rule of thumb, <clears throat> um, if you've got a structure that's got bow spacing at four feet and you've got trusses at every bow, you're more than likely going to have a structure that's going to, going to be equipped for that. I can say don't even think about it if you don't have trusses. It trusses at your bows are your greater than a four foot spacing. I've seen people do it and they can get away with it, but maybe you get that 16 inch of snow in that one event or something of that nature. You just never know what, what you're going to get uh, from that at all. And you know, winds put a significant load on the structure. Like Chris just talked about earlier, they're essentially a giant sail and the wind comes across pretty heavy pushing down on it. Okay, thank you. Another question is, should you perform soil amendments before construction or after leveling? Um, at least from my perspective, should you add soil amendments before or after? I, you know, ideally, I, I would really not like to grade a site because I don't really want to disturb the existing topsoil. Um, fortunately, in our case, we were in a position where we were building it up with the topsoil we were taking away from the adjacent area to allow for drainage. Um, I personally would probably wait to add amendments until after everything is done and, and just my own experiences. Um, I think maybe with the movable system, it might be a little bit different approach or a little bit different answer, and I'll let Krista address that. But from a stationary perspective, I think you want to get things squared out, squared out and, and done and straightened out and, uh, before you start trying to add stuff. Because if you think about it, whether you're on a wagon, whether you're on a ladder, you need some solid ground. Uh, to be able to provide that support when you're up working on the trusses, working on purlins or whatever. And when I start thinking about adding amendments to the soil, I think about working the soil and you got loose soil. I don't know if any of you ever tried to put an A-frame ladder on loose soil and see, <laughs> see how far you get without falling over. Um, and I, like I said earlier, I'm pretty big and I fall pretty hard. <laughs> if I do fall, I just assume not do that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's the same thing, for especially on initial construction, just waiting because it, you end up, you don't think you're going to be stomping around inside the tunnel footprint, but you are. Um, and so it's, it is a lot easier. Now for us, with the movable situation, we're oftentimes working in a, a diversified kind of scenario uh, where we might be working um, soil at different times. Um, so we'll be, rather than tilling everything up at once, we might be using walk-behind tractor to do a couple of beds at a time. In that kind of case, it, it doesn't hurt to... Uh, if you've already moved the structure to, to get in there and do a little uh, work in the soil a little bit. Um, but by and large, we, we, try to, um, it, it, we try to wait until the tunnel is moved in a stationary scenario. But again, again, if you're coming over the top of a, of a, of a crop that's already established, you've already worked the soil. Um, but, it, but in that case, you're, 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 just, you're, you're not standing inside the tunnel or doing a lot to the tunnel while you're moving it. Um, so you, it's not like you're building anything on it, so you don't really have to worry quite as much about the traction and soil stability kinds of issues. Okay, thank you guys. Next question is, are there ridge fence available for Quonset style high tunnels? There are some. Um, I'm not familiar with a lot of them. I've seen a few. Um, there's actually a newer structure from a former professor in our department. He's actually runs a horticultural supply business now. Um, and I'll try to dig it up. I actually I put the flyer for this new structure in my back pocket and washed it in the laundry, so I lost the, the contact. But I can I can get in touch with him, and we can maybe post it somewhere, get that information out. 
um, but there are some certainly some structures that are available with ridge vents for, for pond set style. Great, thank you. And the, the next question is, could you use raised beds in a high tunnel so you wouldn't have to move it? Sure, it kind of depends on what you're moving it for. Um, so um, raised beds are great because they do help avoid some of the compaction issue or help at least confine it to uh, to that footpath, um, but it doesn't really avoid help you avoid the salinity issue. So unless you are irrigating very, very deeply. So the issue isn't so much that uh, if you raise up raise the soil that you're not going to have those problems. It's that you're not going to have those flushing rains getting out of the root zone. So it takes an awful lot of water to push soil out, to push those salts out of the root zone, um, especially on warm days. Um, it, it takes an awful lot of water. So uh, while the raised beds would help maybe minimize some of the compaction from foot traffic and things like that or confine it to certain areas, it won't really help you avoid the salinity issue. If I can just mention one thing, and I'm not sure because it wasn't clear in the question, I would have assumed taking it the same way that Krista did, but whoever asked, maybe you've been thinking about a true raised bed where you've built a frame out of wood and you're filling it with some sort of substrate. Um, <clears throat> it is certainly a possibility, but I think for many of the reasons that Krista's already mentioned, you could still going to have salt build up in that media. Now you can excavate that out and remove that, and it just depends on how laborious you want that to be. Um, I mean, you can probably do anything you want in a high tunnel. It's just a matter of can you do it successfully, uh, have a good crop, and, and do it economically. Uh, but that's certainly an option. But I think, if I recall, don't quote me on it, but if I recall from the equipped program, I don't know that a raised bed, as I'm describing it, is going to be permitted. You have to plant in the soil at least for the first four to five years. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the, if you get one of the equipped high tunnels, and the answer to that actually would be no, it's clear, at least for the first four or five years. But if you're asking, can you do it? Yes, I think you could, but I would, I would want to look more closely at the economics and the productivity of that system before doing that. Great, thank you both. So another question, should all high tunnel constructions use op optional rafter kits? I guess um, if I'm understanding correctly, you're talking about louvers uh, in the in the peaks at the end, end wall structures is what I'm kind of gathering from that. Um, and it, should all constructions use it? Um, I don't know. I mean, it gives you some way to, to re re relieve some heat or get rid of some heat out of the top. Uh, I know some people that can't, uh, you know, they had smaller structures and they weren't going to be able to afford the ridge vent. And so they've done that. But at the same token, you know, I might want to look at the cost and then maybe try to collect some temperature data to see how much heat you're actually getting out of that. Because most of those, I'm thinking at best, might be a 24-inch square, or maybe a 36-inch square in the peak. And not to say that you can't get rid of some, but how much can you get rid of as opposed to a fully open ridge vent? Thank you. Uh, what are your opinions on adding gutters to collect rainwater from a tunnel? I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, we're doing a little bit of this at the Horticulture Research Farm and with some uh, farm research partners. Uh, it's There are a couple of considerations. Uh, I will tell you it's a little bit easier to do it if you've got a, um, a fairly high uh, curtain. So if you're below, if you're a four foot curtain, something like that, you're not going to have a lot of clearance or, or uh, room for that water to run into a larger tank. So you want to be thinking about it um, with uh, a little bit higher uh, roll up curtain if you, if you have roll up curtains. The other thing is you need to be thinking about it not so much from the catchment perspective, but how are you going to use that water. Um, to get a fair amount of pressure on, on, on the water to be able to irrigate using drip irrigation systems, you'll need a little bit of elevation. So minimum of 18 inches. Um, if you're going to run a very ultra low pressure system, um, which your, the drip tape manufacturers will tell you you cannot run it at you know one or two psi, you can, but it's it's inconsistent and you will not get the necessarily the same field consistency that you're going to get uh, running those irrigation systems at the pressure that the tip the drip tape is um, is designed for. So you might need to think about pressurizing that system in some way by pumping out of the tank and things like that. But in general, it's um, not terribly difficult. Uh, it takes some head scratching, but you can use standard, we, we just use standard gutters from the hardware store, although there are, um, you can certainly use beefier gutters or even have a gutter service come out and run a single length gutter along, along your house. 
Um, you will want to probably take a look at, uh, based on the size of your structure, making sure you have enough water uh, catchment uh, capacity to, um, to capture as much water as possible. There's some good um, web resources out there. Um, be happy to be in touch with folks after uh, this, but you can also just Google um, rainwater catchment and some fact sheets from places like Texas A&M will come up uh, and they um, will help you calculate. Um, there's some fairly very simple equations um, for calculating rain, the amount of uh, gallons of water coming off of a, a, a certain number of inches of rainfall over a given area. So you're going to want to be able to make sure that you're uh, engineering things correctly um, to and add it having a little bit of pitch in those gutters, uh, thinking about what kind of containment it's going to go in and then um, and then ultimately how you're going to use that water. If you're comfortable with a low pressure situation um, then and having a little bit of inconsistency in the watering, then it's fairly straightforward. But if you're talking about a big tunnel uh, or needing a lot of consistency in water with certain crops like tomatoes that you can end up with some real problems if you don't have consistent watering, then you need to be a little bit more careful, but it's definitely doable. Great, thank you. If I could add just a few, few things to that. If you're using it as, as she's described and you're using it through a drip irrigation system, it's really not a concern. Uh, but from a food safety perspective, if you were to use it overhead watering, <clears throat> it's now a concern because that's considered surface water. And any surface water is a high risk for some sort of foodborne contaminant. <clears throat> so I just want to make, make sure that you're, you're aware of that. But the other thing that, that, uh, that she didn't mention, though, that I think is really good about the gutter system, though, is remember earlier we talked about water running into the tunnels, and I've seen guys do put gutters on not necessarily to collect the water to use it, but they wanted to, to funnel the water away from their site and stop it from running into the structure. So there's some other benefits of gutters, not just potentially for, for the water usage as well. And I will say, um, at a peer institution here in Kentucky, they do have rainwater catchments on their tunnels, uh, but they've run into problems uh, at times with snow. Um, shedding off of the Gothic style tunnel and catching the lip of the gutter. So it helps to have those gutters when you set them at a little bit of an angle. So you basically set them on a wedge. So there are other, um, Iowa State has um, some plans online for how to do this. They have kind of a fact sheet at the Leopold Center um, that can walk you through um, some plans. And we'll have pictures of ours up on the um, High Tunnel website later this spring as well. Great. And moving on, what is a reasonable cost per square foot to use when planning for high tunnel purchase and assembly? It's pretty variable, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty tough question. I would, I guess, one way to address that would be, who are you selling to? Basically, you know, what, where's your market at? And so, for instance, if you're going to set, sell product in Louisville, that's probably one of the better markets in the state of Kentucky, just because it's a larger city, people have more expendable income to spend. The extra additional cost on something like that. I mean, it, it's really going to be dependent on your own system. Um, some people can crunch the numbers and they can spend ten or twelve thousand dollars on an individual high tunnel and make it work and make it pay. Um, but others, you know, may only want to spend closer to four or five grand for a given high tunnel. I think it has to do with how much time you've got, how much extra money you've got laying around, uh, or how much you know, whatever slush fund or whatever you want to call it, you know, to, to work on this project. Um, I think, you know, there's really not a, just, a, just a one answer for that question, unfortunately. I think most of the time when I talk with growers that are starting to plan or starting to do this, I prefer one-on-one -on -one consultation, so to speak, because I can ask questions because not everybody has the same capabilities, experience, um, or time. You know, I know a lot of you probably have other jobs and you're using this as some sort of secondary or additional source of income, or you're trying to expand your existing operations. So, again, it, it's really highly variable. Great, thank you. As far as site selection, what are advantages and disadvantages of being at the top of a ridge? Um, well, one thing, you know, again, we go back to at least what I think of typically, or at least when I first started learning about tunnels, is you're trying to extend the season, you're trying to maintain heat. So you talk about a valley versus a ridge. I don't want to be in the valley because all the cool air is going to settle in that valley and it's going to be even colder at that point. <clears throat> now, if you're on a ridge, You've got a lot of more winds to worry about to deal with there, but if you choose the appropriate structure that can withstand those winds and you build it right, and you put the concrete in, it shouldn't be an issue. So, and from my perspective, if I picked a valley versus a ridge, I'm probably going to pick a ridge every time. Plus, you're trying to optimize lighting. I know we may have some people that are listening in from other states, but certainly in winter in Kentucky, 
we don't get a lot of solar radiation. So you want to be in a place that you can maximize your solar radiation. You want to be able to have, you know, you want to have clear area around your structure. Um, I've been in a facility where I basically saw a high tunnel in a forested area, and it's just kind of like you, you defeated the purpose now. And your best best tool at hand would probably be a chainsaw. <laughs> I'm serious. It really would be a chainsaw to go just cut some trees down to maximize the light. Okay, great. Um, this one's for Krista. If someone's not planning to have a movable tunnel, should they lean towards more uh, no-till growing? Does that factor into? Uh, as much of an advocate as of no-till and soil conservation as I am, um, I don't know that it's necessarily going to the factors, the, the soil quality or soil properties that um, are affected by no-till are not necessarily those that would be affected by growing in a tunnel, so or by, by issues that you would move a tunnel for. So you'll have salt buildup whether you till or not, if that's, if that's going to be your problem there. Um, basically, the tillage conservation is going to, it will help you conserve some moisture if you can get to a, a lower tillage type situation. True no-till is a little bit difficult in horticultural crops. Um, and it'll also help preserve some of your soil structure. Um, so, but if you're thinking about salinity, disease management, and those kinds of things, that tillage isn't really going to affect those tremendously to a consistent, con tremendously or consistently. So, um, while so while being mindful about your tillage as much as possible is generally a good thing in terms of soil quality. It isn't going to totally um, ameliorate any reason that you would that. Um, and it, it would not ameliorate uh, the reasons for moving in a tunnel, especially especially the salt being a big one. Great, thank you. Um, can either of you talk about automated roll-up sides versus manual um, sides and the cost for automated? <clears throat> On my structures, the, the 30 by 96 foot nor'easters that I purchased, uh, to automate them, I mean, you're already buying the sidewall, so you would have already had that. Basically, to automate them, you need the controller, the thermostat sensor and you need the motors and I think we spent about fifteen hundred dollars per structure for the automation and one thing I'll point out is it really is not a large power load so it's not pulling a lot of power um, but you I could see somebody saying well maybe I can't afford the two thousand dollar investment I kind of already mentioned it earlier and um, you know things can heat up pretty quick in a high tunnel on a clear day when it's 30 even 30 degrees outside uh, and say you're at church on Sunday morning and it was cloudy when you went to church, but halfway through the sermon, the sun comes out. You're thinking, gosh, my tomatoes are cooking, but I'm not going to get up and go to church and leave and go do that. And it's like, well, you have some sort of automation. So my point is, maybe you can't afford to, to automate all of the vents. Uh, but it, say you have a structure with a ridge vent and you only want to automate as little as possible. I would automate the ridge vent because that's going to buy you some time. And even if you don't have a ridge vent, there's, I've not used them personally, but I've seen some... Uh, pop open vents that you can put in the roofs of some of the structures and so again say right now maybe you can't afford the automation for your sidewalls but <clears throat> be thinking about having some sort of insurance or backup plan so to speak for a day where it's going to get hot in there and you can't get back in time uh, and at least get rid of that may be where some of those uh, uh, some of those vents and movers on the gable ends may, may come in handy you might be able to automate one of those for, for very little uh, I'm not sure how much Amp draws on those type of motors, but on those motors, you might even be able to run it off of a solar panel and a, like a 24 volt trolling motor battery. And I've seen that done in different places. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, this is well for both of you. How many people are needed for construction? Would someone in construction need to be hired? And does Equip cover any of the construction costs if you need to hire help? I don't think that Equip limits that. It's a straight payment now, um, but I would definitely contact NRCS about that before you, you know, apply for that if that's a, a big concern um, for you. But how many folks did you have putting up your high tunnels, Shubin? Um, I mean, at any given one point, usually you might have only two to three people working on it because you're you're kind of chipping away at it, as I said earlier. Um, <clears throat> But I mean, if I could have hired a crew of like 10 commercial greenhouse constructors that did it, they could have built it in two weeks, you know, where it took us 12 months to build because we're doing other things. And I think it kind of, you know, depends on what your situation is. If I had to guess, most people with an equip hot tunnel, they get it, they want to get it up and rolling and they want to move fast. But, um, and I'm not, building a hot tunnel is not rocket science either. But if you haven't had some sort of construction experience and some sort of understanding, um, it can be a little bit challenging. 
Uh, I'm not trying to knock any of the companies, but the manuals, just about any manufacturer I've ever seen is really not the greatest. Um, and you're going to pay a pretty significant amount of money. I think I just, just, just to, to see, I estimated the cost to have two structures that we're building now commercially built or built by a contractor. Um, and I think it was going to run me about nine to 10 grand per structure. So, I mean, you could buy two more, you know, you could buy another structure or two structures even for the cost of that. So it can be pretty costly to do. Um, and then as far as how many people, when it comes to skinning it or putting the plastic on rather, you need all hands on deck, you know, on a 30 by 96 foot, I was out there with 12 or 14 people. And I could have probably used more hands. I mean, even when you go out first thing in the morning when the sun's coming up, you think there's as little wind as possible. A five mile an hour wind when you've got a 30 foot wide, 100 foot long sail, <laughs> it's pretty difficult. It can be pretty challenging. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we'll have two more questions and then we'll um, call it a night. Um, so could you also have a movable greenhouse? That's more of a greenhouse traditionally that's heated? Uh, I think that would be pretty challenging because when I think of heating greenhouses, I typically think of a fuel burning source heater like a propane heater. Well, so those lines are buried. You're not going to, and usually solid set, you're not going to move those around. You say, well, maybe I've got a wood burning furnace. You know, I just, again, I, usually those are so large, I don't see that's just something that you're just going to pick up and move down the way. Um, if there's anybody that could do it, I'd probably say it'd be an Amish or Mennonite grower because they're some of the most uh, innovative growers I've, I've worked with. Um, for the most part, I, I don't. I don't see doing that. And if you're already in a true greenhouse and you've got soil problems, I'd get out of the soil. And if you want to learn about soilless culture, give me a call. We can talk about that too. I've actually got a demo. We're working with a grower who's been growing in the soil over the last several years in his heated greenhouse. He's got root knot nematodes. Um, and we're setting it up on a demo trial this, this season. Actually, we were supposed to plant last week, but because of the, the snow, we decided to hold off and save a little bit on propane. <laughs> oh, good thinking. Okay, and I think our final question for tonight is going to be, uh, how many strawberries can you put in a 30 by 70 high tunnel? Do you have maybe have an answer for that, Krista? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, we're generally, so you do want to think a little bit about spacing. Um, and it, it really depends on how your beds are set up. So, um, and how much space you're going to have for pathways and things like that. So, I would leave it to the uh, individual asking the question to think about what their bed space looks like. Do they have five big beds? Do they have eight smaller um, or narrower beds? Are they set up um, the, to go to run the short length of the tunnels or run a long length? Um, then the, basically the way that, that we, we put everything on 12 inch spacing. So just figure out your square footage and uh, that you have in beds and that's about how many plants. Um, so and that, that's about as good of an answer as I can give you but a 12 inch spacing is what's worked for us um, in, for um, strawberries in the past. And if I can add anything about strawberries, I know it's a very high value crop and there's good opportunity to make money in that. <clears throat> but you think of a, of a greenhouse or high tunnel as an apartment complex and how much time that, that strawberry plant camps out there in the fall and then comes through the winter months. And you're harvesting it and you're going to, by the time you're done with that crop, you're going to be past the opportunity of planting it early, like tomato crops, say, or bell pepper crop. Uh, so I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm not saying you can't do it, but plan out what your next step is. Are you going to be able to make enough money on just the strawberry crop or can you find some shorter uh, season crops which you could do um, maybe close to the end of the summer or coming into the fall, something of that nature. But I mean the idea is to have that square, that square footage occupied for as much of the year as possible. Now some people like myself oftentimes I just do kind of like nine to ten months and I kind of take off in the winter time and I don't do it but I know Krista you do a lot of work with leafy greens and stuff and she might be a good resource to talk about some of those other uh, crops that you could do that are going to be shorter. Uh, but I just want you to be thinking, you know, uh, people always think about strawberries, but think about the time that it's spent in there. Is it paying out for the six months or seven months that it's in there? And it may in your market. Maybe you can sell locally grown strawberries in Louisville and you can sell them at such a high price that, and, and, I'm, uh, and it can be done. I know yeah. people that can do it. Um, you know, we had a plastic culture demo for open field producer. And the, the producer actually had a fine dining establishment uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I think he made something over like six, seven thousand dollar profit on less than half an acre. 
like you told any large scale commercial guy, they could make that on an acre, they'd be tickled, <laughs> let alone on less than half an acre. So anything's possible, but there's going to be some pretty unique marketing or niches or something of that nature. And I just want to add to that as well. For folks who I've known that have made made a go of strawberries in tunnels, it's oftentimes because they're a diversified grower that's going to the farmer's market and they've got fresh fruit in the spring three to four weeks before anybody else. So this, they might be losing money on the strawberries, but it sucks people into their stand and they buy their arugula and leafy greens and root vegetables and stuff there. So like Shubin said, it takes the right market niche for it. So you might not be making the money off the berries, but it gets people in the door. Definitely. Well, thank you both for your time this evening. I think we're going to have to cut off um, now. We've run a little bit over, but we hope that was really helpful to everybody who's been listening. And I'm going to put in one more plug for my survey before we go. If you could all please fill it out. I've uh, also put a link in the chat box. So you should be able to click right on and get straight to the website um, from it. Um, and um, I think that's all. We also, I don't know if we mentioned, uh, we have some files to download in the uh, left corner of the screen, and those are available for you to download right onto your computer if you want to. Um, so I'll leave uh, the uh, meeting open for a little while here so people can go ahead and do that. But those um, documents are also going to be available tomorrow with the, re or when we get the recording posted, we'll post everything with it. Um, but some of the equip information from our last webinar, I decided to put it up again um, just because we weren't able to have that first one live. So that's there. We also have a Center for Crop Diversification High Tunnel Profile um, that's sort of an overview and can cover a little bit more of this um, for you if you'd like to get, uh, get that and read through it. Um, so thank you all for your participation. And like I said, I'll leave the meeting room open for, for a little bit longer. But um, we will um, see you next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Have a great evening.